Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Hi, obviously I'm not Bruce. <laughs> I'm Renee Daphne Kimball. I'm subbing for Bruce this week. Graciously, I really appreciate the opportunity. And with me tonight as our guest is James Buchel. He's sort of a local firebrand lawyer who gets himself involved in a lot of things. And he's also chair of the Multnomah County Republican Party. So today we're going to have a little discussion on free speech. We're going to have a few roll-ins for you, a few clips for you to look at, very short. But they give you some ideas to think about in regard to free speech and the whole concept and how it's interpreted by some people and how it's restricted by others. So that's what we're going to be discussing today. And uh, we were going to have another guest, uh, uh, Joey Gibson, but unfortunately he wasn't available this week, but he will be available on the 30th. And we're hoping we can bring another show and he was the fellow in regard to the uh, free speech rallies that were here in Portland. So let's get into it. And I'd like to ask James, since you're a lawyer, is there like a legal definition for free speech? Well, the classic provision is the First Amendment to the United States Constitution, which says Congress shall make no law <laughs> abridging freedom of speech. And uh, no law is pretty definitive. Uh, <laughs> Justice Black used to say that no law means no law. He was right. an absolutist. Um, but over the years, various exceptions have emerged. And most importantly, the whole common law doctrines of libel and slander, and when you're allowed to, you know, what right. we're, there's no real constitutional protection for false speech. Right. There's no right. real constitutional protection for speech that yeah. sort of is fighting words, that is, you know, imminent incitement of violence. But it hasn't really done anything yet, but you know that it's going to happen. Yeah. yeah. How the, do you... The fire in the crowded theater example. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, that, what about the fire in the crowded theater? I mean, obviously, nobody in their right mind wants anybody to scream fire. Right. At the same time, being a libertarian... I'm not sure I want to put him in jail for doing it, but I do think that there ought to be some kind of consequences for endangering other people because basically that's what the person's doing. Well, it's the problem with the problem with all that is it's a very slippery slope, you know, it, because once you start talking about danger to other people, then you start arguing right. about degrees yeah. of danger, and then you start talking it. about people who right. don't feel safe yeah. and when then, certain yeah. things are said. That's true. <laughs> so where, where, how can, is there any way to draw a line? Because I know if you scream fire in a crowded theater, you're going to find yourself in jail. Probably. If you live, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, barring the fact that you might die. But... Um, what is to prevent somebody from doing that well, it, it other all, than the next person beating them up? <laughs> well, it's the same thing that should protect us in all cases and doesn't, which is reliance on the good sense of the judges. Right. You have this absolute First Amendment out there, and then you have judges who are faced with hard cases to make mm -hmm. exceptions to it. And, and uh, luckily, having an absolute starting point tem tends to limit the development of the hard cases. Right. Well, let's, um, before we get started too deep into this, what I'd like to do is do uh, the roll-in, the first roll-in that we have. And this woman is a very unusual woman. She has a track record for understanding the subject of free speech quite well. And her name is Deidre, Deirdre McCloskey. And she taught at the University of Illinois at Chicago from 2000 to 2015. And she teaches economics, history, English, and communication. She's a well-known economist and history and historian and rhetorician. Aha, uh -huh, I haven't seen that one before. She's written 17 books and is quite the authority on just about every aspect I've ever heard her speak on, on libertarianism. She is also a transgender woman and has been for quite a number of years and is uh, has some very interesting stories to tell being a libertarian transgender woman. So if we can do the roll in, I think I see a yes. Uh, we can go to the first one with Deidre and it's called This Professor Will Challenge Your Perspective on Free Speech. Yes? Free speech is a sacred phrase in our society. 
Everyone thinks it's a good idea. It's in the First Amendment to the Constitution. Hey, it's great. But I want to complicate things a little bit because I want to associate free speech with the ancient word for persuasion all the way back to the Greeks, rhetoric. Now that sounds like a bad word. People are always saying, oh, Senate campaign mired in rhetoric. Is being persuaded a bad thing? Well, it would be a bad thing if there was something other than persuasion that could get us to the truth. But there isn't. We're humans. We depend on language. All we can do is persuade each other about the Pythagorean theorem or persuade each other about the virtues of General Motors products or persuade each other about who to vote for in the next election. Why is it the only alternative? Yeah, to get into because too. all the, the yeah, only other also, thing you can do besides trying to sweet you talk to the, the, people, the thing about trying to change their minds, as we say, is violence. I can change at least your actions, if not your minds, by drawing out my 38, which I keep in my purse, and saying, you believe in economics or I'll shoot you. And you say, oh yeah, yeah, I believe in economics. Yeah, economics is great. And that's, that's all we have. For example, advertising. Now, advertising has a bad press. People say, they, they always use the word m manipulation, I mentioned before. Oh, it's terrible. People are trying to persuade you. Now, wait a second. The only, if a alternative is violence, how else are we going to decide whether Coke is the real thing? How else are we going to decide what automobile to buy, except by people trying to charm us? In a society of so free choice, it really does. free ideas, and the last free one, consumption, such a good you've got to, you, you, you have persuasion have as the only alternative right to credit. violence. So a free society is an advertising of society. A free society is a rhetorical society. A free society is a speaking rather than violent society. I think her voice is electronically produced. Okay. And that's it. <laughs> okay, we're back. Well, I hope you enjoyed that, and I hope Deirdre gave you some good ideas about what free speech is and why it's so important, and why not having free speech or curtailing it in any way is a serious problem. So, James, talk to me a little bit more about the the concept of of in the legal profession. How much does the free speech thing actually come up? Well, it comes up quite a lot because people sue each other all the time, and, and people sue each other when they're unhappy with something someone has said about them. Right. And so there's a very large body of libel law that says that tries to distinguish between opinions on the one hand and specific misrepresentations of right. fact. And so is this false or is it just, you know, sort of This rhetoric? person's idea about yeah, how yeah. you look and, you know, right. I don't like you, you look like a, a toad. Right. And so this on and this so person forth. is a yeah. fool. Well, is that, this person right. is a fool would be sort of an expression of opinion. You know, you get closer to fact when you say, yes, this person failed their entrance exam into law school three times. You know, well, well maybe then. if that's maybe if that's not not true, that's a libelous statement, especially if they're a lawyer right. now. You know. Yeah. <laughs> so so really, uh, from where I stand point, stand is if the speech is damaging the person in some way, then for me that would be the time to go after them. Say if somebody uh, libeled me and I lost an opportunity to get a job and I was actually financially diminished by the fact that a person told a lie about me. Well, Mr. Gibson would have been a good example because yeah. he just lost a job because the Antifa people ran some crusade to call up the real estate broker that he worked for and claim right. that he was a Nazi and a bigot and a white supremacist. As far as I know, these things aren't true. But I doubt he would have a legal remedy because I think the courts would say, well, these are just more, more like questions of opinion. and. And, and this is the unfortunate part about having no black and white rules and having just to trust the judges to make these decisions because it's, it's, then you get very 
very differing outcomes depending on the case and the person so, and whether he's likable or not. And right, so forth right. So it becomes a popularity contest in, yeah. instead of finding out what the truth is. Yeah. Well, so in this particular instance, I, you know, this is kind of bottling my mind here. Even though he's been disadvantaged, he's been fired. Number one, I thought he couldn't be fired for all of those things that they were calling him. So it's like, I don't understand that in the first place. But he lost his job. He's diminished. He's going to have to get out another job. And this person who just willingly walks down the road and starts, you know, blabbing obscenities about somebody, nothing happens to them. So yeah, yeah. Well, and we had that problem a month ago or two with the Republicans. We were going to march in this Avenue of Roses parade we've been marching in. And in comes an email to the parade organizers. You know, if you let these Republicans march, you know, we'll drag them out of the parade. We'll have a mob of hundreds of people we'll there. You've seen what we can do, you know. So that's speech, yeah. right. pure speech. And the pure speech result was that the whole parade was canceled. And, you know, we, we thought, right. well, is there something we could do about this? Well, the first problem is, of course, we can't find anything out about who sent that. Only no. the, only the no. police can, and right. they have no interest in it because we're Republicans. But beyond that, even if we had found out, then there would have been a formidable First Amendment defense, which is, you know, well, I was just saying how much I hate Republicans, and, you know, they shouldn't have taken it seriously, and, and, and it was just speech. <laughs> right. So they're, they're, you're, you're actually kind of hamstrung in that regard in the area of free speech. So basically, again, bottom line, it all still comes back to principled people. If you don't have principled people acting responsibly, then you're going to constantly be caught up in situations like this where there is no free speech and you don't have any recourse to well, do anything about it. Well, there is free it. speech and there's more yeah. and more of people sort of sort of exercising free speech in a way that, that, that injures others, that becomes you know, something they can't recover for. And one of the interesting things is that the left has made a real concerted effort to make it harder and harder to file libel suits. Now, personally, mm -hmm. I think this is because the left moves its agenda by telling lies a lot more than the right. Although neither only side slightly. Is, yeah, only slightly. Only slightly. You're a libertarian. I have to, I have to, I have to say it from the Republican just, point you know, of view. But, it's like nip but, and tuck as far as I'm concerned. But, 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 but be that as it may, they've, they've passed all these procedural statutes now where if someone injures you through speech and you decide to try and defend yourself by saying, hey, that was libel, that mm -hmm. was slander, that injured me in my business or profession, then the answer is, oh, we have a special procedure for you. You now have to sort of prove your entire case up front without any discovery or anything, although usually the discovery is the speech. And if you lose, you have to pay their attorney fees. Okay. And so, oh, and okay. so there's, a tremendous, there's a tremendous chilling effect. You know? Yeah, you think? The normal American rule that allows people to go into court and make a case without having to pay, you know, extraordinary fees on the other side if they lose is gone in, in the First Amendment context. And so as a result, I think there's a lot more libel and slander going on. You know, there's it's one of a whole species. Yeah. Now, and I'm noticing one of the things that I'm noticing a lot is I listen to people talk a lot because I, I like to find out where people are kind of based and where they're coming from. So I listen to conversations when I go out for coffee a lot. And I'm finding that people are, they're lying a lot. Well, how, how else do I say it? They're lying a lot. They're little lies. They're little tiny lies. They're lies about what they know about someone or what they know about a situation or, or something in the future. But they're little lies and they keep on lying every day like this. And I'm just wondering, how does this work when you're trying to have a society where you don't libel each other and you want to, you know, be kind and be generous and, and be copacetic? So how do we roll it back? You know, that's one of my questions is well, how do we as a, individuals... That's not a free speech question. I mean, I have this sort of long-term historical view that you start with sort of an apostasy against some sort of religious or moral order and then you have moral disorder and then you have political anarchy and we're kind of moving toward the third phase now <laughs> I'm, but, but i'm not interested in going there james i really just has no kind of patina of yeah i'd like to travel there for a holiday no i you know for me i want to see people get over this hump and, and one of the things that i like really well is what i'm noticing with the millennials is this this inability to swallow the road apple, let's put it that way. They have this, it's almost genetic incapability of, of 
believing about 90% of what they're told. Of course, there's there's this the set that, you know, I call the mushroom set, who will believe anything you tell them. And then there's the dark set who only believe the dark stuff you tell them. But most of the kids that I find out there are really much more questioning than any other generation I've seen. Really? Except for the stoned out hippies in, in Woodstock. So, uh, you know, I have a lot of faith that these people are going to start asking some serious questions and they're going to start standing up and, and and making people accountable for both what they say and for proving what I'm at, what I'm seeing is I'm seeing them ask for proof when somebody says something about somebody else and no you know before it would always be oh yeah 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 and then you'd go the other person would be off and running and have more to add to the fire but now what I'm seeing is these people are stopping and going well where did you hear this who said this how do you know this? And that's the first time I've ever seen that happen. So I'm, I'm hopeful. I think well, it's I'm a be... lot more pessimistic than you are. Well, Indeed. Why? Even the que- why? Because even the question, who said this, you know, takes us to an area where law has decayed and we care less about truth than all of these identity groups. And so, you know, this, this to get us back onto the free speech topic, you know, there's the topic of hate speech, you know, and, and, I have sort of this simple model of government, which less is better, but what's even better is that we don't have a government that sort of tries to distinguish among all these identity groups and has different standards of conduct for different races or sexes or or ages or, you know, just simplify things and and avoid setting people at each other's throats. Right. And so, so... these these whole these hate speech laws are essentially well we're going to take certain groups and things that are said against them it's more important to punish than things that are said against others right and it feeds this idea of well who said that is it from someone i like is it and we've gotten right. very far away from the objective truth of things you know right. i can i can argue with someone about global warming and I can put on a piece of evidence and the question, well, you know, who, who said that? Who said that's really irrelevant? You know, either there's a temperature station there that measured it or not, right? Yeah. <laughs> but if you worry about who said it, I think you're going down the wrong track. So, but I'm pessimistic, what can I say? Well, I'm optimistic, so we make a good <laughs> set of bookends here. Uh, one thing I'd like to mention is that we are having the phone lines open for the whole show this time. So if you feel the need, please call in with your opinion and your ideas about free speech we'd love to hear them and love to be part of it and also because we value our calling people so much we have some free gear for you so the things down here on the table i don't know whether they can uh, get a look at it but i can hold up some of them let's see we've got uh we the internet we've got some dvds we have some racy reason magazines and um you know some a very very Funny stuff by, um, let me see if I can hold all of them. Yay! Can I do that? Um, Hold all those up. Uh, These are the things you can choose anything on the table, anything you'd like. So if you have a calling question, please, please, we'd love to hear from you and and see what you have to say about the subject of free speech. So um, also, one of the things that we have here for anyone who calls in is the law. The law. Can you hear it? Oh, do we have a call? Oh, okay, great. Thank you. We have a caller. Yes. What's your question, sir, madam? Hi. Whoever. I have a question about um, during during the elections in 2016. There was a big deal about Citizens United, especially from uh, Hillary. She, she wanted to overturn the Supreme Court decision. Um, what What do you guys think about Citizens United? Is it did the decision protect freedom of speech? I think it does. I mean, the context of this case is that a nonprofit corporation made a film that was highly critical of Hillary Clinton. And the answer to this of the government was essentially, you're not allowed to show a film, uh, you're not allowed to put this film on TV or whatever because it violate you haven't disclosed properly all your blah 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 there's a, there's a huge apparatus that wants to regulate sp- the spending of money related to speech hmm. you know and the count the counter argument is that well if we don't regulate money and 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 sort of stop 
corporations from spending their money to promote certain points of view, then what will happen is we will only hear the points of view of rich people. And the answer to that, I think, is that we have other problems, like we have got this unconstitutional printing press so mm -hmm. that all these people are sitting next to the printing press, snorfing down all this money, and then they can blow it out in all this you know, free speech about how great printing presses are and so forth and so on. <laughs> but, but that evil, that wrong, is not a reason to restrict uh, freedom of speech. And so if a bunch of people want to get together and call themselves a corporation and raise money that way and go do speech that way, I don't think that's something we should be messing around with. Excellent. Good. And I agree with you. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, it did. Excellent. And what would you like? Anything here on the table? <laughs> DVDs? Reason Magazine? If, uh, what, uh, what, what you can do is uh, the person will take your phone number and uh, you can let them know what you would like and we're happy to send it out to you. Thanks for calling. We appreciate it. Okay, thanks. We um, also have these lovely little cards here that we like to tell people about. It says, thank you. And this is a little card that we pass out when we go out to eat and what it actually says inside is that if you give a waiter or waitress the uh, quote tip but you call it a gift then by the rules of the game it's not taxable so therefore that's what we do and on the back is this really cool little game that's called, um, could you be, uh, it's called the world's smallest political quiz. Sorry for my gardening hands, I just realized I didn't, <laughs> I've got the manicure from purgatory. So, if you'd like any of those, please let us know and we'd be happy to send those out to you. So back to this, this topic of free speech, one of the things that I find, uh, some, of the, some of the millennials that I talk to are going to school at PSU, is they're getting a little uncomfortable with the concept of trigger words. So can we talk a little bit about what do you, how did, the, how do you think this whole concept of a trigger word happened? Because I really am at a loss to figure out how any of this came about. Well, I think, I think it's people focus very much on themselves and what they like and what they don't like. And so people can be sort of trained up to be sensitive to certain things and, uh, and, and certain things are inherently unpleasant. And so we have this move in society that some people think that the government is there That's a phone call. <laughs> to protect them from all unpleasantness. And, uh, and so this has produced this idea that if what you're going to say is unpleasant to me, you should just shut up. <laughs> Okay, I think we have... <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think we have another caller. Uh, and caller, what's your question? I have a question for James. Uh, he said I didn't know about this procedural change where the, where the, uh, the, plaint the plaintiff has to, uh, has to pay the uh, defendant's legal fees if they lose. And I thought that, that exists in Great Britain, at least, I think. And I was wondering if that had a chilling effect there as it's seems to have here. Oh, I think it, it has a massive chilling effect, and it has been adopted in nearly every state that I know of. They call it a, they call it an anti-slap statute. <laughs> SLAP okay. stands for Strategic Lawsuit Against Public Participation, because what would happen okay. is the environmentalists would go out and they would tell a bunch of just staggering lies about some business that wanted to mm -hmm. open or something, and the businesses were very successful in shutting them down. And uh, this thing sort of changed the, changed the threshold so that the business couldn't really show the bad motive or anything. They would have to prove their whole case right up front, and, and it flipped the ordinary attorney fee rules on, it, on, its, on its, you know, completely the other way around. So now for most libel and slander cases, yeah, if the plaintiff loses, the plaintiff is going to pay, wow. pay the fees of the defendant. And those mm. fees are just phenomenal. I mean... The garden variety case, the simplest little case, the lawyers will show up for the defendants, they'll file some 50-page brief with every Supreme Court precedent on oh free speech in it, and it's $50,000. And, and people just can't afford, can't afford to defend themselves against lies under yeah. these circumstances. Yeah, and that... Yeah. Well, this is the way it is in Europe, I understood. So is that, is it, do they have the same problem there then, or...? 
Uh, I think they're. I think they they have the same problem there too. I think England in particular mm -hmm. has some very tough, tough libel laws that uh, that uh, chill chill speech a lot more than here. Right. Thank mm. you. Right. Yeah. There is not. There isn't. I I have some friends in England and. Free street is free speech is a memory in England. It really is. It's, it doesn't exist anymore, and it hasn't existed for a great long time. I'm friends with a band called Seize the Day, and they were actually they actually had one of their songs uh, about Monsanto banned. They really? could not perform that song in England, nor could they sell the song in England. Yeah, it was, it. it was uh, you know Food and Health and Hope. So if you want, <laughs> look it up on the internet. Food and Health and Hope. Most scathing indictment of Monsanto I've ever heard, and it's so well done. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that shows you that, you know, free speech is not a given. And no. I think people here in the United States don't understand that without a constitution, and, most, and no other country in the world has one, you don't have any guarantees. <laughs> The Constitution of their seas say, "Oh well, you have this, uh, you have this privilege, and they call it that, until we decide you don't," and that's what their constitutions look like. So, yeah, it's free speech sad. doesn't exist anywhere else except in the United States, really. I think last week in Germany they had sent something on the order of thirty raids with SWAT teams coming in to these people's houses about Facebook posting. Facebook and, and, postings. And you look at this and uh, you know part okay. of it is part of it is the absurdity Whoa. of uh, of sending a SWAT team in over a Facebook posting and and I think oh. basically most of them were people complaining that there were too many immigrants, a couple of them were left-wing posts, but but once you get into this business of regulating speech, the government goes berserk with it like everything else, you know, and it's right. it's right. it's we now have, you know, all these militarized agencies and, and, and you know, it, I, just, I just can't even wrap my head around it as a taxpayer. You know, why on earth would I want to send, you know, two cars full of highly paid government officials to go out and, and get this guy for Facebook postings when you could just send him a letter saying you've right. been summoned yeah. to justify your Facebook, right. but, but that's the way government is. But and it's, it's the <laughs> message of shut up and sit down. Yeah, exactly. They're sending the very clear yeah. message of you too yeah. will find yourself in the same position if you don't shut up and sit down, and it works very effectively. Are you familiar with a, a, local, a local organization? Do we have? I'm not sure. Nope. No calls yet. Um, have you heard of a local organization called Next Door? Well, it's not local; it's national. It's a it's a very finely tuned national experiment of seeing how people operate in, in neighborhoods. No, no, nothing about well, it. Well, check it out. It's it's www.nextdoor.com. I think it. I don't think it's .org. It may be .org, but it may, I think it's .com. And what it is is it's a mini Facebook for your neighborhood. Only if you read the rules in Facebook, in um, Next Door, you find that you do not have the privilege to criticize Next Door, and that if you do criticize them, you can get kicked off. Well, I mean, everybody takes that as being funny and, oh, they'd never do that. Well, I can testify they do. You got kicked off. Huh? I got kicked <laughs> off. I made them, I asked them to be accountable to about people who were flagging other people and say, why don't you just tell us who's flagging and why they're flagging? And because I criticized next door and said, aren't we big enough to get the information, I literally got kicked off next door. But that's not the worst part. The worst part was all of my posts that had I ever done on next door were scrubbed and they took away my husband's privileges. Hmm. They wouldn't let him post. He could, he could look at everything, but he could no longer post. So it's, you know, it's cutting down a free speech is not just a, a, an area that's, that's taken care of by certain people. It's, there's a concerted effort to actually shut down the language that's going on out there. So, uh, you know, watch what you say on next door if you're on it. Just keep it light and happy and you probably won't get, any, get into any problems, but you may get your, yourself kicked off if you criticize their little thing. And I'll probably never be able to get back on now that I've said that. <laughs> so what about what about some of these trigger words that uh, we're hearing? How what I I somebody brought up the concept of well that's just intolerant. A friend of mine from Australia said well that's just being intolerant. She couldn't understand trigger words at all. 
Well, I think I think that's true. I mean, people who want to regulate speech they don't agree with are staggeringly intolerant. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you see, we have to be tolerant of their intolerance because no. we have to be tolerant. That's funny. You know, I, I was reading the other day, there was a philosopher in England, Karl Popper, I think. And Popper had this paradox of um, social evolution, which is when you have a tolerant society and the tolerant society will tolerate the evolution of this these intolerant subunits <laughs> and the tolerant society at some point has to become intolerant <laughs> or it will be taken over by the intolerant subunits and so i think we have to be very intolerant of those who want well, to limit in. free speech there you go because otherwise they'll shut everybody up <laughs> yeah and i agree with you i think that a lot of this has to do with um, one of the things that really surprised me, I came back from uh, 13 years in Australia in 19, at the end of 1992, beginning of 1993. And I, I'm sorry, I hit the ground and I was in shock. I could not believe what had happened to this country in the 13 years I'd been gone. I did not understand political correctness. I did, I was, whoa. My husband wound up calling me a, a loose cannon on the deck of political correctness because I just never got it right. And I could not understand why people were so upset and uptight about opinions. When, when I had left, everything seemed to be okay. And, you know, nobody was getting uptight about, you know, what you were saying. And then to have lived 13 years in a place like Australia, where, I mean, an Australian will walk straight up to you and say, oh, doesn't, they don't even know you, right? And they'll walk up, oh, my God, dear, you got such a bad jacket on. You really got to go home and change. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, they, they are the antithesis of, of political correctness. Hmm. And to come back here and find political correctness just so rampant. Where do you, where do you think this came from? This The public this, schools. Shh, don't say it. The public schools. Public schools, the really? The public schools. This is... There, there are a lot of sinister things going on in the public schools, and uh, and this is one of them. You know, this is the, the, they are, I mean, more than half of universities now have codes that, frankly, are an obvious violation of constitutional rights. Some of them are private, so I suppose right. they can get away with it. Yeah. Um, but, but there is, and and large fractions of of college students are educated to the point where, well, we can't. We can't uh, we can't have free speech because it just causes too much psychic anguish to to various victim yeah. groups. Yeah, exactly. Well, we're going to come back in a few minutes. We'd uh, we've got a second roll in for you that I think you'll enjoy. This one's um, a little provocative, but I think you'll find it very interesting. It's about Fleming Rose, who's the journalist, author, foreign affairs editor at. Jalans Poston, I hope I said that right, and is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute. He is previously an editor of the Danish publication Jalans Posten, uh, where he was the principally where he was principally responsible for the publication of the Mohammed cartoons that ignited an international controversy in 2006. He's the author of The Tyranny of Silence. And which is published by the Cato Institute. So we'll have two minutes of this gentleman speaking to you about free speech can beat bad ideas and criminalization can't. Thank you. Well, as long as they do not incite violence, I think they should have a right to say whatever they want. And in fact, I believe this not only as a matter of principle, but also as a matter of practical uh, reality. Uh, you and I uh, fight these people and their ideas in the best way, not through bans and criminalization, but through an open and free debate where we challenge them in the public space. Mm -hmm. I have never seen people change their beliefs just because they were criminalized. Right, just because of a ban or a punch. Or... You drive them into the underground and uh, and it makes them sexy in a way when they are you know, not allowed uh, to air all their bullshit in public. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I, I, I believe it's the most effective way to, uh, to, uh, to fight them. Um, I believe that, uh, that, that you should never uh, criminalize words just because of their content, only because of uh, you know what they call for. 
yeah. that is incitement to violence. Apart from that, I, I'm in favor of a very narrowly defined libel law, mm -hmm. and I'm also in favor of the protection of uh, a right to privacy. And I believe that privacy and free speech, in some instances, are two sides of the same coin. Because if you know that the government, if we, if if you know that the government is surveilling you at home, you will speak less freely, mm -hmm. and that is an invasion of your of your privacy. Okay, we're back. Thanks for joining us today where our subject is free speech and I'm subbing for Bruce Broussard. I'm Renee Kimball and this is James Bu Buchel here with us, with me. And we're having a discussion about free speech and we enjoy having you phone in with your opinion and discussion. So uh, when you see the numbers across the bottom of the screen, it's 503-288-4448. I'll just say them off the top of my head. I know them now. Yay. <laughs> it took me a while. Give us a call, and anyone who calls in will get a uh, one of the free things here on the table. We have all kinds of DVDs and magazines. And uh, we'd like to also remind you that if you're interested in libertarian ideas, we do have a meetup once a month, which is on the second Wednesday of the month at the Lucky Lab starting at 6 o'clock. So you can come down and find out a little bit more about these ideas. Quiz us. Hammer us. You know, tell us how you don't like what our opinion and tell us why because we love to hear it. And because that's the way you get yourself stronger in your own opinion of what you like and what you believe and what you think is correct by sharing it with other people. So we're always happy to. So back to free speech. And now one thing that's really kind of confused me I don't really understand the issue of the internet. It's like, can you just sort of, in a nut, how does, in a nutshell, how does this free speech thing work with the concept of what they want to do with the internet? Like Mozilla is constantly sending me emails saying, you know, we have to we have to take care of this problem and and not have uh, certain people able to move the internet in certain directions. Do you think that that's actually going on? That that some of the searches are being um, not well, shut down but diminished or, or well, I'm not sure preferenced? What, we have very great problems in this country with the concentration of economic power because we used yeah. to have something called the antitrust law which has more or less died. Um, really? And I mean, hmm. there's very, there's not much enforcement of it there. I mean, why should it cost, for example, if I want to buy this book, how can it possibly cost the same amount to buy a paperback as it does to buy an electronic Kindle book? Well, hmm. it does that because of, you know, sort of an abuse of market power. It ought, yeah. it ought to be a whole lot cheaper to just buy something that you download, right? But that's not the case. And with the internet is is a bunch of wires that are owned by private entities and all these private entities have contracts with other private entities and so people are always trying to advantage themselves in one form or another right. by you know crippling the traffic of the people that they don't like and you know and, and, and so there's a whole war that goes on there with standards and connections and, and, and tariffs and how much you pay for this trunk and that trunk and this connection and that connection so but that, but that's sort of a whole fight that operates in an area different than than, than free speech. Yeah. So, but the net, the thing with one of the things that I've noticed over the past few years, the the direct availability, your uh, your ability to get to the information, the end information you want, has diminished over the past six or seven years, to where <clears throat> I could put in. I'm pretty good at search phrases. I can put in a search phrase and, you know, usually on the first or at least the second page, what I'm looking for would come up. Mm -hmm. Not now. Well, I, I mean, frankly, I can't even get to the the actual <laughs> website when I type the website into the address line. And right, I'm going, but, but what is that, this? But in, in the early days of the Internet, 
there were a whole mm. lot less websites and there was a whole lot less web advertising, right? Yeah. So now if you have 100 times as many websites and you have 50 companies out there advertising and they've all tracked your history to try and know exactly what they think they can try mm. and sell you. And so you may know what you're looking for and, and they and their, in their search results and their, right. you know, out will come all these things that they want to sell you or the places they want to steer you. And, and, and it's, it's an unfortunate development but it's it's the way the internet is running right now hmm. what about um one of the things that i've noticed with one of the things that, that hugo got the other day was a notification from facebook because he's not very active on it and this was like a movie of him all animated with all kinds of cute clever sayings and pictures from all over the internet that he most a lot of them he'd never even seen before and this thing went on for like four minutes. <laughs> and it was like, okay, it's like I'm not really down with somebody, you know, spreading <laughs> my life around like a, a smorgasbord well, out here. So well, where's, well, you know. Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, in, in early America, people lived in these small towns and everybody knew everybody. And if you walked out of your house and said things to people, everybody in that little town would know what you said. And, and. Now it's the same way if you go out and set, set a foot on the internet. Yeah. You leave a little footprint here and a footprint there, and you like this and you post that, and, and people can assemble all this right. stuff. You know, and before I, too long, <laughs> before too long, the, the internet, the internet uh, gossip crew Nazis are out there putting it all together for you. Well, they want to, they want to sell their product. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know what to think about all that. I'm... I'm some of the European countries now are are moving to this thing where you sort of have a right to be let alone and a right to delete history that you no longer like about right. yourself and right. and yeah. that bothers me too because yeah. that's that's you know you went out and posted something on the on on Facebook yeah you wall shouldn't be able to you shouldn't be able to just eliminate history so, I don't I, know. I'm really kind of not down with that either I don't know. it's a, it's a tough problem there's a there's a, a a group that I belong to called Galt's Gulch which is uh, kind of based after Ayn Rand's um, book. And it's the idea of this place where libertarians can go and talk to each other. And they have um, a rule that unless you're a member, you cannot modify your posts at all. And if you are a member, you're supposed to say exactly what you did when you modify the post. <laughs> so it's, it's, I, I kind of find it refreshing where you have a complete you know, advocacy for full disclosure of everything that you're doing. Well, and part, technology is improving to the point where if people really want to, I think they can have their own private communities that are sort of beyond government control. It's a little tricky to do, be, yeah. but it, 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 it can be done. Yeah. Uh, I, I think a lot of the, the thing with free speech that I've I've made a determination in my own life is to not do the social networking, the Twitters, the Facebook, any of it. I just don't do it, and I haven't for almost a decade now. Well, because <laughs> for me, yeah, I know yeah, you. Ha everyone says you have to, but for me, I just made a decision that th a that was not what I consider communication, because you're missing like three quarters of it. You like you're getting a, 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 I call it a pap smear of, of. <laughs> you know, communication with the person and that tells yeah. you everything there is to know about it. So it may cut you off from the millennials. I mean I Well no it doesn't. That's the whole thing because I'm finding a lot of them are doing the same thing I am. They're tired of it. You no, know, there's an awful lot of people out there who have a very large presence on social yeah. media and yeah. I as I attempt to advance the interests of the Republican Party of Multnomah County, we, we use these things. How right. effective they are, I don't know. But. And, and I'm, I'm worrying about that because I'm, you know, we're talking about free speech. And I'm finding that um, when people speak to each other, it isn't, they don't, it doesn't seem like people are free when they're talking to each other. This is something that I've noticed the way people are communicating. Personally or online? Uh, personally, when they're when they're interacting with each other, it's almost like the the guarded speech that they're using online has now filtered into their everyday life, and it just I feel like sometimes when I'm having conversations with people that they're so self restricting that their ideas are going in places that they really weren't intending their ideas to go because they restricted what their actual thought was. Well, I would have hoped that 
the online and the social media things could help fight against that by essentially you know, giving people a mask so they didn't have to worry about exposing themselves. Yeah, yeah. And this is very important in totalitarian countries yeah. like China, where there are people who, you know, can if, if you blog the wrong way or you don't blog anonymously, you can uh, you can be thrown in jail. And, mm. and it's a wonderful thing to the extent we have it. I don't really know to have a technology where people can criticize the government and the government can't figure out who said it. You know, yeah, back, that back would, in yeah. Czechoslovakia in the 50s, you know, you'd have to sneak in somewhere and get a mimeograph machine. Yeah, and and what is that, samizdat? Is that yeah. what they called it? You know, where you'd print out these things and hand them out. Yeah. And, and Back to Sophie Scholl's in World right, War Sophie II. Sophie Scholl's, the White Roses. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and so to the extent that the Internet can provide this anonymity, it may encourage coarser behavior, it may encourage, you know, but it can yeah. also be a weapon against totalitarianism. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, is interesting here in Portland is we do something that's called Chalk Talk. And basically we go out and we pick out a place and a bunch of us have... Uh, libertarian sayings or sayings about, you know, good economics, and we'll chalk them on the sidewalk. Well, we went to Pioneer Square to meet up, and so I chalked on Pioneer Square, Square chalk top. You know, it's chalk. I'm not painting it there. I don't think I'd sat down more than two and a half seconds before the security guard was over there telling me, you know, that, you know, I couldn't do this, and if I attempted to do anything more, that I would actually be arrested for uh, in not what was it something something so absurd it was ridiculous endangering the the square or something like that. it was it's just, a terrorist activity now. I just yeah. kind of looked at it and I said you're, you're not serious this is a joke right no and he said no very no serious. I'm very serious man very serious very serious I went okay all right fine well we won't we won't put any more little dirty chalk on the board you know in Pioneer Square and we sat there and waited and then when everybody came we got up and we left and within like a second of us getting up and leaving, there was a scrubbing crew out there taking the chalk off the, off the pavement. Well, this, so. this goes to this gentleman's Citizen United question earlier, which is, you know, how do you get your message across in a context where all of the mass media voices have been narrowed yeah. and narrowed yeah. and narrowed to you? the point where yeah. it's either six mm -hmm. or four companies now own nearly every radio, television, newspaper station and so people do resort to things like you know the chalk um, in, in in Venezuela now you'll love this one in Venezuela um, women are now getting on buses with an empty square and standing up and doing TV shows to the buses because they've got no other way to communicate I love it. I love it. And, 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 and so, this is so, amazing. And, and, you know, the regime is not very popular, as you know, because oh, it's well. starving all their people to death. Um, That's incredible. And in state of socialism. But but there is, yeah. people will work very hard to find ways to communicate, notwithstanding, you know, totalitarian control of all the mass means of communication. Right. And I, and I think that the more, there's a concept, uh, we do a, a spiritual practice called Vipassana meditation. And in it, there's this concept of Dhamma. And Dhamma is this um, this concept of being connected to the universe. Everything in the universe is connected to everything else. And so Dhamma, the concept of Dhamma, is all the good in the universe rolled up into one. And so the, the idea is that Dhamma can never be put down. So as hard as they keep trying... And the the, like the more they keep Star doing Wars. it, it's like it's like the you know the pop and fresh doughboy. You squeeze here and it pops out there. You squeeze here and it pops out over here, and that's what's happening. The more they try and shut down free speech, these really creative, crazy ways of having free speech are just popping up all over. Well, the you're place. an optimist. I'm a pessimist. I am. I no, mean, the technology look, of control is advancing by leaps and bounds. I it's know, but sad. I the human heart and the human mind and the human human spirit is also advancing. I believe we are evolving, <laughs> and that's all there is to it. And I'm sticking to my guns. And I think that we can we can actually have some influence over this because I, look, I believe everything's energy. And if you use the energy of your mind to kind of focus the energy over there, maybe you can kind of shift it, I don't know, a little bit anyway. And if a lot of people do it, maybe we can all get together and do it. So I'm very hopeful about what I see in the future. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's not going to be nip and tuck for a while, but I think eventually Dhamma will out and you will not be able to suppress that part of the human soul that is ever effervescent 
and and just so desirous of being free. I don't think you can actually ever do it. And the more harder they try, you know, you can just be as pessimistic as you want. But the harder they try, I think that we're just going to come up with all kinds of creative things like Chalk Talk and and what these women were doing, you know, TV shows in front of the buses. That's actually, I'm going to, that's captive audience. I specialize in captive audiences. I go out and I sing, I sing songs. Seriously, I do this. In front of the line at, at Voodoo Donuts. I mean, come on, think about it. Who's going to get out of line at Voodoo Donuts? There you no go. No one. There you go. That's so a good they place sit there. People who gather petitions. So, uh, you know, the TV, the, the bus line captive audience. I like this idea. I might incorporate <laughs> this one. So you never you see anything happen out there. So, so I, I think we covered a, a lot of free speech here. And uh, one of the things I'd like to do at ending the show is kind of a summation video, a little two-minute, 40-second video on... Um, the the topic we've been discussing today, free speech, why it's important and why it should be valued and why we need to take a real serious look at any attempts to curtail it in any measure whatsoever. So we'll be having that at the end and I'm hoping the wonderful crew that we have here will give me a, a cue as to when they would like us to put it in. We'll keep talking here so if we can roll out on that one it would be really great. But free speech is, is important. I think we all agree on that. I don't think there's anyone who will say that free speech is not important, although I think there are a couple people at PSU I met that might. <laughs> but at the same time, I think it's how you define what is free speech, and I think therein lies the devil. Well, you know? Freedom is an absolute. Right, yeah. and, that's, and that's the part of it that we need to continually look at is, is who, who is making the definition for us? Are we getting an input on this or is somebody else defining for us what is free speech? Because we would really like to have free speech on our terms rather than what somebody else determines for us. And I'm sure you would too. I can't think of anybody who was willingly... Uh, make a list out for you of the subjects which they would be happy to never discuss again for the rest of their life. I don't think there's anyone on the planet. Why should we care about free speech? On college campuses, students clamor for restrictions on speech that they consider offensive, hateful, or disturbing. Internationally, countries consider further limiting speech in the wake of violence like that committed by those who object to portrayals of the Prophet Muhammad. In the American media, Many commentators question whether such offensive and provocative speech should even be allowed. And why should it? What good does it do to let people offend others' deeply held religious beliefs? What good does it do to allow people to say racist or bigoted things? What about homophobic slurs or remarks demeaning towards women or any other nasty, hateful comments that you can imagine? Wouldn't our country be a better place if we shut down that kind of speech? No. Freedom of expression matters precisely because it allows us to voice and hear unpopular and controversial views. You don't have to like offensive speech. In fact, you should feel free to vigorously denounce and criticize speech that you see as wrong. But when people resort to force to prevent or restrict expressions that they disagree with, they undermine the very principles of freedom and tolerance that they claim to defend. When we allow the open expression of hateful opinions, we create opportunities to publicly refute them. The U.S. Supreme Court has upheld the right of neo-Nazis to march through Jewish neighborhoods while expressing acutely offensive and distressing views. But when such ugly demonstrations have taken place, much larger counter-demonstrations have arisen in opposition. The result? Greater awareness about the importance of taking a stand against hate. Allowing offensive speech also matters because it promotes the progress of human understanding. Some expressions, once widely denounced as offensive or even dangerous, have won vindication and become received truth. Whether it was scientists like Galileo challenging religious dogma about astronomy, abolitionists calling for the end of slavery, civil rights leaders demanding an end to Jim Crow laws, or gay magazine publishers whose work was labeled obscenity. Speech that authorities once tried to censor has instead contributed immeasurably to our culture. When authorities seize the power to silence offensive views, they also of necessity seize the power to silence dissenting and minority views. In effect, censors pursue a policy of ignorance by design. That's why smart societies respect freedom of expression, even when, especially when, it causes discomfort and offense. Are we back?
Yes. Well, thanks for joining us for the show this week on Free Speech. I hope you enjoyed some of the videos that uh, you saw. There's lots more on Learn Liberty. Dot org. Um, there's some great videos on a lot of topics, some really exceptional ones on the environment, by the way. So uh, check that out, learnliberty.org. And some of the other ones that you might like to uh, check out are We the Internet. If you're really into humor, you're going to love We the Internet. So check it out. They're very short, tiny little videos. They're, uh, some of them, I think the longest any of them are is five minutes. And they really are very, very... One minute? Two minutes. Yay, team. I'm really good at this eventually. <laughs> so thanks again for joining us. And we've had a lot of fun today talking with James Buchel, our local firebrand lawyer, and me, Renee Kimball, talking about free speech, a subject that's near and dear to both of our hearts and I'm sure to yours also. Because without it, we're right back in the dark ages. So keep your voice open. Keep it loud and keep your principles in front of you all the time. And join us next week. I think Bruce is going to be back next week. I'm not sure what the show is going to be, but he always has some exciting guests. Great time. And uh, we've had a good time here. And also remember, when you call in, if I'm doing the show, you can get uh, free copies of The Law, which I'm happy to send out to you. It's one of my favorite little books. And... I would love to send it out to you. So again, thanks for joining us. We've had fun talking a little bit about free speech. And uh, some of the videos that you find on free speech, we'd like to hear some uh, from some people. Uh, go to the Oregon Voters Digest uh, YouTube channel and you can make some comments there. We'd love to hear from you about what you thought about the videos, what you thought about the show, what you thought about us. And if you like the show, please tell all of your friends. And if you hated the show, tell your enemies. They'll watch anyway, and we'd be happy to have them as, as people to call, call in. So, But uh, we've had a great time. And uh, I think Bruce has been doing this show now for quite a while, hasn't he? Oh, yeah. It's an institution. I think it's, yeah, I think it's one of the longest-running shows on cable access, actually. I think he's been doing this for over 20 years, which is really... An amazing feat to have had a, a program on TV that long. He's, he's kind of getting up there with Johnny Carson. <laughs> he puts on a forum for things that. Nobody yep. And uh, he's he's, he's very. It's very interesting that he has run for office so many times, and I have to admire that so much about Bruce because he does get out there and do the job. He doesn't just talk about it, which is something I really admire about him. So thanks for joining us here at. Oregon Voters Digest. It's always a good show and hopefully we'll have uh, Joey Gibson on the 30th. If uh, Bruce doesn't have anybody planned, hopefully we can bring him in and we can talk a lot about some of the things that he's been going through and find out his perspective on what free speech is all about. Thank you. Yay team!